When you hear the word cryptography, what comes to mind? Do you think about Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, securing information, or maybe you envision a hacker sitting behind their desk in a dark room on their computer, just as we see in the movies? Over the past several years, I've asked countless people from around the world this exact same question, and that is, when you hear the word cryptography, what comes to mind? We think a ton about cryptography today, but its history is often overlooked and dates back thousands of years. In this video series, we're going to share with you the history of cryptography from ancient hieroglyphics and ciphers up through present day. In order for us to get to cryptography today, everything from Bitcoin to the future with quantum computing, we first need to take a trip back in history to better understand how we got here. I'm going to let my co-host, Michael Strike take us back in time as we begin with the early origins of cryptography. Today we embark on a thrilling journey through the ages to explore the captivating world of ciphers. From the ancient Romans to the battlefields of World War II, ciphers have been the custodians of humanity's most valuable secrets, guarding them against the relentless pursuit of those seeking to exploit them. With each passing century, ciphers have evolved and developed, driven by an unyielding conflict between those who seek to secure the purity of information and those who seek to exploit it. I'm Michael Strike. Join us as we explore this fascinating blend of art, science, and mystery from ancient substitution and transposition methods to modern algorithms based on advanced mathematics and computer science. Get ready to be captivated by the wonder and intrigue of cryptographic ciphers, a timeless reminder of the enduring power of secrets and their keepers. The Atbash cipher 500 BC is a substitution cipher that was first used in the Hebrew language. The cipher works by substituting the first letter of the alphabet with the last, the second with the second to last, and so on. For example, in English, A would be substituted as Z, B, Y, and so on. So used primarily by Jewish scribes and scholars in ancient times to encode messages in the Torah and other holy texts, it was also considered to be a sacred method of encryption and was used to protect sensitive information from being accessed by unauthorized individuals. The name Atbash comes from the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph and Tav. I think I pronounced those correctly. When these two letters are switched using the Atbash cipher, they create a new word. Shishak. I'm certain I did not correctly spell or say that. But the Atbash cipher is not limited to the Hebrew language. Oh no. It can be used to encode messages in any language that uses a standard alphabet. One of the most interesting things about the Atbash cipher is that it is incredibly simple to use and does not require any special equipment or hardware. Which is really good because equipment and software were very limited during the time of the Hebrews. All that is needed is a basic understanding of the alphabet and the ability to substitute letters with the Atbash method. But the simplicity of the Atbash cipher also makes it vulnerable to being cracked by skilled and unskilled code breakers. With enough time and resources, it is possible to decode an Atbash encoded message and reveal its hidden message. I said that twice by design. Today, the Atbash cipher is still studied and used by cryptographers and codebreakers as a historical example of a simple yet effective method of encryption. It may not be as widely used as other more complex ciphers, or hardly any ciphers, but its legacy lives on as a testament to the ingenuity and creativity of ancient scholars and scribes. So in general, I think I can say that the Atbash cipher is a simple substitution cipher that reverses the order of the alphabet. Modern technology can easily break this cipher using frequency analysis, uh, which involves counting the occurrence of letters in the cipher text and statistically comparing them against the frequency of letters used in the English language. Let's continue with the Skeetail cipher. This was named after the tool that was used to create it, a cylind cylindrical, I can barely say it, rod called the C-tail. The C-tail was used by the Spartans as a way of communicating securely during military campaigns. To use a C-tail cipher, a long strip of parchment or leather would be wrapped around the C-tail, and the message would be written lengthwise along the strip. When it's unwrapped, the message would appear to be a jumbled mass of letters, but when wrapped around another CTEL of the same size, the message would be able to be revealed again. So this is an example of a transposition cipher, which means that it rearranges the order of letters in the message rather than replacing them with new characters. The CTEL cipher was a simple yet effective way of encrypting messages during the time that it was used. So. It was used by ancient civilizations, including the Greeks and the Romans, but it was eventually replaced by more sophisticated ciphers. 
However, the Cetel cipher's legacy lives on as a testament to the ingenuity of ancient scholars and scribes, well, that had access to a slip of paper and a stick. The Cetel cipher was eventually cracked by the Persians during the Greco-Persian Wars, who were able to reverse engineer the encryption method by creating their own sticks of the same size and shape, of course. Now, while the Cetel cipher may seem rudimentary by today's standards, it played a crucial role in the history of cryptography and set the stage for more complex encryption methods that would be developed in later centuries. In fact, the principles behind the Cetel cipher are still used today in modern encryption methods, such as uh, Data Encryption Standard, or DES, and the Advanced Encryption Standard, AES. So what were its weaknesses? In contrast, modern technology can break the Cetel cipher easily because it relies on a fixed size rod, which is a weakness that can be exploited with algorithms and computing power. By analyzing the patterns and frequency of letters, modern computer algorithms can break the Cetel cipher in a few seconds. Now, it's a little interesting to why they may not have thought of creating a rod with a circumference at the base and a smaller circumference at the top so that it was actually a variable rod length, but just nobody did that. The Polybius Square is yet another cryptographic device used to encode messages. Coincidentally, it was invented by the Greek historian and scholar Polybius of the same name during the second century BC. Polybius was very interested in creating a cipher that could be used by military commanders in order to send secret messages to one another without the risk of interception or decoding by enemy forces. So what exactly is the Polybius square and how does it work? Well, it's a simple grid made up of five rows and five columns each cell in the grid contains a letter of the alphabet, except for the fifth row, which contains the letters K, W, X, Y, and Z. To use the Polybius square, a message is first written out in plain text. Then each of the letters of the message is replaced with its corresponding grid coordinates. The resulting string of numbers can then be transmitted securely as long as the recipient knows how to decode it, which is pretty much the same with any cipher encryption algorithm. Decoding the message is as simple as this. The recipient uses the Polybius square to convert each pair of numbers back into its corresponding letter. The resulting messages can then just be read in plain text. But why was the Polybius square so effective at encoding messages? The answer lies in its simplicity. Unlike other ciphers that relied on complex algorithms or mathematical formulas, the Polybius square could be easily memorized and quickly deciphered for those that had a memory and could decipher things. This made it an ideal tool for military commanders who needed to send and receive messages quickly and securely. Despite its effectiveness, the Polybius square was not foolproof, not even close. Like all ciphers, it could be cracked with enough time and resources. In fact, during World War II, the Polybius Square was used by the Germans to encode messages, but it was eventually broken by Allied codebreakers. Today, the Polybius Square is studied by cryptographers and codebreakers as a historical example of a simple yet effective cipher. It may not be used by military commanders anymore, but its legacy lives on as a testament to the ingenuity and creativity of ancient scholars like Polybius. Let's continue with the Caesar cipher. The Caesar cipher is a substitution cipher, meaning that it replaces each letter in a message with another letter at a fixed number of positions down the alphabet. For example, with a shift value of three, then every A would be replaced with a D, every B with an E, and so on. To better understand how the Caesar cipher works, let's take a look at an example. Suppose we want to encrypt the message, hello, using a shift value of three. The first step is to write down the alphabet and shift it down by three positions. You'd have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J as the, as the plain text. And with the cipher text, you would have D, E, F, G, H, I, J. Now we can substitute each letter in the message with the corresponding letter in the cipher alphabet. For example, hello, H-E-L-L-O would be K-H-O-O-R. The resulting encrypted message becomes a bit scrambled so that you can't really tell what it is at face value. To decrypt the message, we simply shift the cipher alphabet back by three positions and substitute the letters back to their original form. 
So what are the weaknesses? Well, this is Caesar cipher. It's about 50 BC and uh, modern technology can break a Caesar cipher by brute force methods in which every possible key is tried until the correct one is found. This is done by exploiting the fact that there are only 25 possible keys in a Caesar cipher, making it a relatively easy cipher to break. At the time, the Caesar cipher was the state of the art. But at the end of the day, how secure can something that was named after a salad really be? Well, Crypto Kids, that's a wrap on our first episode. Now it's for our next episode. We're all set to roll up our sleeves and dig further into the cryptic underworld. We'll be unearthing the secrets of the Visionaire Cipher, a nifty piece of work from the 16th century. And we'll keep trudging on until we hit the cryptographic drama of World War II. Keep your eyes peeled for more revelations as we start time traveling through the archives of cryptography.